here it is. So now we're going to talk about scene film characterization with X rays. And the layout of the presentation is roughly what is shown here. We're going to talk about the motivation. We're going to ask ourselves what is a scene film. Uh, we're going to go a bit about X-ray attenuation and, and brush over several techniques that, use, that are useful for the scene film structural characterization. And there are more. This is by no means exhaustive. So first, about the motivation. Why do we need to study scene films? Well, you might have noticed or not, but they are everywhere in our electronic devices, uh, uh, coatings, in our coatings here, ah, now I can see, in uh, well, lasers, of course, yeah, a bunch of coatings in cars and planes and walls, coatings, thin films are everywhere. And the, one of the most common use, uh, issues that they address, are, for example, are friction or heat and corrosion. So they are there to protect and make a longer life for a particular beam in a bridge. Mm -hmm. So yes, they are very important. And we need to know their structural uh, uh, properties so we can give them a longer life and avoid, let's say, cracking or peeling off our cars. So. And, and thin films in general, they will have a behavior different from the same material in bulk. So it's important to study specifically the thin film and learn how it behaves. So uh, what can we measure for in thin films? Well, well, there's a variety. There's a small angle X-ray reflectivity. There's grazing incidence, small angle X-ray scattering, grazing incidence wide angle X-ray scattering, grazing incidence XRD, reciprocal space maps, we can do pole figures. And we, with these characterization techniques, we're gonna get information about the thickness, the roughness, porosity, uh, structure, stress, texture, defects, and well, you can actually read it here, composition, uh, whether they are very nanostructures. So we want to learn everything about that thin film structure. And we're going to make it better. And what kind of films can we envision? Well, they can be either single crystals or polycrystalline or amorphous. And maybe they have buried nanostructures in, uh, inside. So they, they can be of almost any kind. Uh, so. We have X-ray beamlines, hard X-ray beamlines. So we're going to use hard X-rays to investigate the thin films. And what will happen with a very thin film if we have an incoming beam? Well, in general, you go through the thin film and everything is going to scatter. A little bit of scatter signal is going to come from the film. And a whole lot is going to come from the substrate that we probably know and not but it's not that interesting. So in a, if we do a powder uh, X-ray diffraction of in this case here, we're going to have strong peaks coming from the substrate and only tiny little peaks that maybe we don't even see from the film that we are interested on. So to solve this, the common approach is to come in a grazing incidence. So when the X-rays in, go, impinge the sample grazing. Ah, it's fly here. Yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> when the X-rays come grazing uh, into the sample, you can see this. Let's say this uh, this distance here is the attenuation length. Then, in the grazing geometry, I have more uh, scattering in the film that I'm interested on, and less scattering coming from the substrate, which I probably already well characterized. So we want to come grazing, and we want most of our x-rays to be attenuated on the thin film that we care about. So we need to know the attenuation length. And for that, what is the attenuation length? Well, 
is the distance over which the X-ray beam intensity will drop 1 over E, that's the Euler number, of the incident intensity. So yes, the intensity is going to fall, and that's the attenuation length. And then, well, denser materials will have shorter attenuation lengths, but higher energies are going to have longer attenuation lengths. That's why hard X-rays go through stuff easily. And then there's the attenuation coefficient, that is just the inverse of the attenuation length. And where do you find attenuation lengths? Well, there are several options. One is the CXRO website. Another one is the XOP X-Power gadget, that's a free program. I'm going to show it. So this is the CXRO website, Center for X-ray Optics, which has a database for X-ray interaction with matter, and it has attenuation length database there that you can access. So you can fill in your material formula, you can enter the density if you know it, or minus one to use the online density. You fill in a incidence angle, this is normal incidence. And then it gives you, oh, there's also the, the energy range here. And then it gives you a plot. And because I chose copper, you can see the attenuation length for copper goes up and then it falls here at the edge, uh, the K absorption edge. And then, and if you hit here, then it will give you the numerical data. So the, the second option, if you uh, download the XOP X power, you can use this uh, little gadget here, enter your material, enter the density if you know it, or question mark to use the database one, the thickness, and it will give you the absorption, the attenuation, and it will also give you the, the numerical data if you want. It. So with that, you know your material, okay, I'm you select the right energy and the right incidence angle, so most of your beam will be attenuated on your film. So how do we measure this? Well, you can either use a home the diffractometer or the diffractometer at a synchrotron. Uh, you're going to put the sample in the, the center of the diffractometer, and well, you want the sample to be in the center of the beam, not lower or higher, and you want it to be parallel to the beam. So to make sure that the sample is on the center of the beam, you're going to move it up and down and get this shadow intensity signal with a detector behind the sample. The shadow is when, like here, the sample is completely blocking the beam, and here is letting it up. So you can position the sample at the center of the beam. And to make sure that it's parallel, then you're going to rock the sample. And with this rocking scan, you get this, uh, characteristic triangular shadow uh, shapes on the downstream detector of when you are blocking and then maximum intensity and then you block more by rocking the sample and then you, you're going to place the sample parallel to the incoming beam. And then it's, you're going to iterate and then it's aligned. So Let's see some examples of gazing incidence diffraction applied to polycrystalline films. Uh, it, well, in the regular specular geometry, omega, the incidence angle is equal to theta. So we're going to be using this geometry where the incidence angle is grazing. And then the detector moves uh, to scan to theta. Oh. I'm going to apologize because I changed here to alpha. That was the incidence angle omega in the previous slide. I'll change this. Uh, grazing incidence requires several corrections. So it requires absorption correction, Lorentz polarization factor correction, uh, atomic scattering factor, and particularly a refraction correction that it grows more important as mo the, the more grazing the incident angle is. So this is the shift on the uh, measured peak positions, depending on the delta from the refractive index of the material and the incidence angle and the two theta. And these shifts can be as high as, let's say, 0 0.01 degree uh, shift in your measured peak position. So if you are interested in determining accurate lattice parameters, you want to make sure that you have made your uh, corrections to the measurement. And with 
grazing incidence by tuning the incidence angle, you can see that you can also gauge different depths in your sample. So you can change it and then get sensitivity to different regions, deeper or shallower, uh, by controlling this incidence angle. And here's an example of a grazing incidence uh, uh, research, and this time in uranium oxide exposed to air. So this group, they started by changing the grazing incidence angle from large to smaller and smaller, so more and more grazing as you go down in this figure. And they notice, you can see how the peaks get weaker and broader. So if we narrow in the 18 degree region, you can see how the peaks gets weaker, broader, and it also shifts in position. So with this, this uh, down here, they're more sensitive to the surface. So with this, they, they conclude that there is a, a different lattice parameter at the surface. It's, they conclude that it's more disordered because the peaks are broader. And well, they, they get to know what is in the surface of this uranium oxide with uh, using deaf uh, sensitive grazing incidence, X-ray diffraction. Okay. Uh, this is one last example of grazing incidence diffraction to a micro, to a polycrystalline film. This time, ruthenium platinum zinc film electrodes. Uh, in this particular case, they were increasing the, the ruthenium content in this mix. And they notice as they increase the ruthenium content, there is a phase transition from FCC to HCP. And most interesting, they found that the phase transition in the zinc film happens at a different concentration when compared to the same uh, bulk material. And then they are able to make a phase diagram uh, in, as a function of the ruthenium fraction for their electrode material. Uh, now, so far we saw examples of raising incidence diffraction applied to polycrystalline zinc films. Now I'm going to show an example of grazing incidence diffraction applied to single crystal films. So for single crystals, we take our diffractometer and swap it around <laughs> so that we can, we have, we end up in this geometry and the sample is like this, sideways. Say the beam is coming this way and the sample is going to be this way. And so the film is here in this surface and we're going to scatter this way. <laughs> um, as opposed to the regular geometry when we go this way, right? So we're going to move it like this and scatter. So this is going to select HKL planes that are all in plane. Let's see if we can. Here's another example. This is an our old diffractometer that we move out. Again, the sample is sideways. And the x-rays come from here, and then they go up to, to the detector that moves in the 2 theta arm. And again, the alignment includes the moving up and down and rocking. But there is an additional uh, alignment step when you're dealing with single crystals. Because it's a single crystal, you're likely going to have to rotate around your phi axis. This is something, this is phi. So to align a particular HKL plane in a single crystal, you have to find the right azimuth. And when you're doing that, you want, you want the phi azimuth of your sample to be parallel and coincident with the diffractometer phi axis. To, to achieve that, the, what we do is we, we shine a laser on the surface of the sample and we rotate phi and we mark on a wall the spots, the reflection of the laser every 90 degrees. And it's usually all crooked when we start. So this, there will be sep sep separate spots on the wall, right? And then we're going to come and adjust our uh, arcs here in the goniometric head such that we make these spots as close as possible. And when we, don't, when we do that, then a phi rotation of the diffractometer 
uh, we're, it's going to coincide with the sample normal and then the spot's going to stay put and it's not crooked motion like this, which we do, we, it will kill the single crystal alignment. So this is an example. In this case, we had uh, European telluride nanocrystals and a barium fluoride substrate with a barium fluoride cap layer. And in the, this first example, with the coplanar geometry is not grazing incidence. The diffraction of the this HKL111 is completely dominated by the signal coming from the substrate. It's very strong. So these are, uh, you can see uh, some oscillations here and, and another frequency here. So this very low frequency here is a clue, a, a hint that we have something there very, very small there. We can barely see our European telluride uh, nanocrystals here. And this is for different growth times, uh, 36 to 40. So these are very, very narrow, uh, very, very thin films, 25, 40 angstroms, like, like nothing, right? So we cannot see those nanocrystals in the regular geometry. Now, when we go to the coplanar geometry, when we're choosing an HKL set of planes that are completely in the plane of the, the sample, sure. I don't know if that's this over here. <laughs> so we, this is very grazing. And when we measure in this configuration, the, it, well, we measure changes completely. So all of a sudden we can see, this is the peak from the European telluride uh, nanodots. And this is the signal from the cap layer and a little bit of the substrate here. So now we have good signal. And we can clearly see peaks from those 40 angstrom thick nanocrystals. And we can see it, we can see the peak uh, changes position and width with the growth time. And now we can start getting conclusions about strain and well, lattice parameter. Uh, if, we, if instead of doing one scan, we do many scans and we stitch them together, we get what we uh, call a reciprocal space map, right? Usually, you, most of the time, you see single linear scans. But you can imagine that if you measure many uh, like this, and you then stitch them together, then you get a two-dimensional measurement. This is a reciprocal space map, and then you get more information. It takes longer. Now, the synchrotrons have lots of flux, so it's pays off. It pays off because then you get uh, information in more directions. You get more size city and you get uh, 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 particle size. You, you, besides strain, you, you get a lot of information. So this is a stark contrast of between what you get between grazing incidence and well, coplanar regular uh, diffraction geometry in a thin film. So next, I'll talk a little bit about small angle X-ray reflectivity. Uh, probably not too much because there's a talk about this later on. Let's see. Oh no, oh this is different. Yeah, this is completely different. So small angle X-ray reflectivity. This particular example is no diffraction, is scattering in the surfaces and the interfaces of thin films. And it's going to allow you to get information like thicknesses, density, and porosity, roughness of the interfaces. Um, and you can find it uh, with different names. It can be X-ray specular reflectivity, it can be reflectometry, it can be XRR. And it's very useful for thin films, as you will see. So what happens when you come with uh, and, and hit grazing on a thin film uh, with X-rays? If it's very grazing, you have total reflection. Uh, the beam is not going to enter on the, on the material. At a certain critical angle, then you're going to have uh, a, a beam traveling along this direction. 
And above the critical angle, you have reflection and refraction. So there's a bit of the beam that's going to come inside. And this critical angle is related to the density of the material. So it gives you information about the material. And it's around here. And this is the reflectivity of the silicon for, for copper K alpha. Uh, and when you have interfaces, uh, there's going to be a beam that goes here. So it will also reflect here and go up. And it's going to enter here. And if there are more films, well, it was going to reflect and refract at every interface. And then the beams coming out, they're going to interfere, either constructively or destructively. And this interference will, will, will give rise to typical oscillations that you can see in the reflectivity of seeing films. And these oscillations can be used to extract the thickness of the, of the thin film with this formula here. And you get the period of the oscillation. Uh, and then you, you can calculate your thickness. And this is a simulation of, uh, what did I did here? A chromium film on a silicon substrate with different thicknesses. And you can see the thicker the film, the more frequent the, the oscillations. So very thick films will have very, very frequent oscillations. So the delta theta is going to be very small. So for reflectivity measurements, you want a very small divergence in your setup. Because you can imagine if you are coming with a divergent or convergent beam, you can make two theta steps as small as you want. You're not going to see these oscillations. They're going to be washed out by your beam divergence. Another thing to notice in reflectivity measurements is that they have a large dynamic range. So they start really intense, and they go down several orders of magnitude. So if you want to measure to relatively high theta, you need a detector with a high dynamic range and well, lots of flux to start with. So you usually start with filters and different filters in different regions here. And this is an example of reflectivity of a super lattice. So here you have several periodicities. And there are several frequencies coming out. So the, the small frequency is related to this period of the super lattice. And the high frequency oscillations are related to the whole super lattice stack thickness here. So with, with, with this measurement, you can tell what did I actually grow, and then go back and adjust your growth parameters and get what you want out of your machine. This is an MBE machine here. Mm -hmm. You can also get roughness. So roughness is going to kill your reflectivity. The, fast, the higher the roughness, the faster the, the reflectivity signal is going to fall. And this is an example for a 100 Armstrong chromium layer, where I go and I increase the roughness. And you see increasing roughness is, well, it's, it this destroys your measurement. <laughs> so you, yes, you, you can get roughness and you don't see anymore the, the oscillations of the, the beam interfering in your sink film. And there's one thing to keep in mind with reflectivity because we are incident and grazing angles, then the footprint of your beam on the sample is stretched and longer, the more grazing the angles are. And at some point, it might be that there is beam spill above and below the sample. So if you consider the reflectivity of the ratio of the outcoming to the incoming intensity, then here it's not fair. You, you have to account for this beam spill somehow. And this is the accounting for this beam spill is what we call the footprint correction. So you, you know your beam height, and you know your sample length, and you're going to determine at which angle I'm going to have beam spill and uh, add a multiplicative factor here proportional to that. Where is this? 
And this is what? I think one last example of uh, reflectivity. Let's say you get your measurement, and, and then you're going to bring a model. First, a very rough model, and trying to uh, improve this model and make it closer to your sample. So in this case, we let's say the fit is the red one, and here's the measurement. So I can easily get the periodicity by calculating that uh, with the little formula for D is that I showed before, but of, it's not matching here. So in the second uh, iteration, you go maybe add some rough to the roughness to the interfaces, and in the third iteration, maybe you say, well, maybe there's a uh, let's change the density, or maybe we should add a, a, an oxide cap layer. And then like, bit by bit, you go adjusting your model until the simulation and the measurements re have closer resemblance. And then you can sort of trust, this is a reasonable model for my sample. Or I'm just not going to work anymore on this. Uh, and for those reflectivity simulations, you can use many programs. Of course, you can use Jesus too. <laughs> and there's other super old parrot that This one is paid, and this one is free. This is the only one paid in this list. And this is one I've been using recently until I discovered Jesus that can do that now. Um, and here's the, well, XOP IMD. Uh, IMD is a gadget that runs inside XOP, and you can set up your uh, substrate and layers and multi-layers and uh, so surprisingly has a very good help. The manual is very well uh, detailed there and you come up with simulations like this and then, then you learn about your sample. How much time do I have? 15? Okay, look at that. Uh, I think this is the last technique I brought, uh, grazing incident small angle x-ray scattering. In GSAS, in GSAS, all the angles involved, the incoming beam and outcoming beam, they are all grazing <coughs> angles. And you're going to measure your signal with an area detector that is protected with a beam stop uh, for the direct beam and sometimes also for the specular beam. So the detector is in damage. And it's going to give you information about varied nanostructures. And in GSAS, well, what else? Uh, the scattered signal is going to be uh, two. Com we're going to have two components. One is a component from the from these nanostructures. They have a size, shape, a density. So you're going to have a form factor that is the Fourier transform of this nanostructure shape. And you're going to have, if they, if they have any order relative to this other, the, these nanostructures, then you're going to have an interference function, which is going to be the Fourier transform of the pair correlation function of the nanostructure positions. So then the GSA signal has both size and shape and orientation of the nanoparticles information, as well as information of how they are placed relative to each other even if they have a cap and you can't see them with microscopy. But yeah, microscopy is something that you usually want to use to complement this res uh, research. And these are examples of uh, the different nanoparticle shapes. These are, what was it? That the first one is a cylinder, the second is a sphere, and then you have a pyramid with different orientations. So you can see different orientations will give you different signals. Uh, this is a simulation, and here again, for example, the pyramid, whether it has a sharp tip or it's cut, again, has different signals. So simulating a GSAS signal uh, can be very useful to learn what kind of nanoparticles you have there. So for modeling software, there are several options. There's East GSAS, there's Gix GUI, Fit GSAS, Born Again. <laughs> And these others here. And here's an example from East GSAX. 
this time there's a, these are palladium islands on magnesium oxide. And here's the experiment. And they did simulation with a couple of different uh, uh, approximations. And with these simulations, well, once they got some similarity, they can get information about the size, aspect ratio, uh, spread of the size distributions, and learn about their samples. And, the, and also the distance among them. Here's a one last example, oh, oh, one more example about GSAX. Here's the microscopy. So these spherical gold nanoparticles are quite homogeneous and quite ordered in the substrate. So there's a periodicity. And the GSAX signal is going to show a periodicity too. So by doing horizontal and, and vertical slices here, then they can get the size of this, uh, the size of these crystals and how they are uh, ordered sideways, and they can get the, also the size of the coherent domains. And this is truly the last example from Jesus. This time, it's a gold thing grows on a on a polymer. On the top row here, there are the measurements for different uh, uh, growth timestamps different gold film thicknesses. These are simulations. And by, by comparing the simulations with the, with the measurement, they can get uh, some insight on the growth process that is going on. And they, they conclude that there's a, the growth process starts with some nucleation and then lateral growth. And then these particles are going to uh, start coalescing and, and co uh, merging together, and finally, there's going to be a vertical growth. Let's see. So those are the examples for the different techniques for raising incidence diffraction that I brought today. Now I'm going to talk a little bit about the Brockhaus sector. Sorry. Uh, Brockhaus, we are the uh, phase three beam lines, a uh, suite of three hard X-ray beam lines on the Canadian light source. On the north side, two wheeler beam lines and one uh, ondulator beam line uh, with energies from 5 to 95 kV. And there's uh, several options here for zinc films and many other applications, but let's talk about zinc films. So you can either work in the lower energy wheeler beam line or in the ondulator beam line and, and do. Uh, uh, these techniques that I've shown here today. And, well, this is the IBM station that you heard about in the previous talk. It's also useful for seeing films. And this is a, a group web page, uh, brockhouselightsource.ca. So if you want more information, you can find it here. This is the Canadian Powder Diffraction Workshop that we ran in 2020. There, there are talks here, and we, soon enough we'll have a new tab here for this uh, school, this summer school, where we're going to have the, the talks also available. Let's see what else. Uh, conclusions. If you have a sample, you have to do XRD. <laughs> <laughs> if it's a very thin film, you likely want to do it in grazing incidence geometry. So you're more sensitive to the surface. And then with these techniques, you get information about thickness and roughness, porosity, density, strain, and, and, and many more. And with that, I'll conclude. Uh, do, if you have questions, please. Yes. <laughs> Often faced with questions about thin films, but the substrate is not smooth. So it would be uh, uh -huh. what is there a strategy? Mm -hmm. The answer can be no, there's no strategy. There might be some, but it's not coming to mind now. I don't know. There must be something. Maybe lower energy X rays that won't penetrate. Yeah. Um, you mentioned that 
How do I do what? The refraction fraction for the gradient. Huh. Yeah, that's a question I had for Bob. <laughs> uh, we know the formula, we could do it manually. That would be annoying, but. <laughs> so it's something that we hope that he will add soon. <laughs> In Jesus? Yeah, we have to do it manually. It's important for the for more grazing angles. Uh, there's a reference there for the paper, and they have graph where they show that yes, that that it, it, get, it gets really important when the angles are really grazing. Yes. What, what kind of characterization did you do when you mentioned the goal to the spherical nanoparticles? So are you measuring the thickness of the thickness or the distribution of the nanoparticles, or maybe the amount of the particles? They were doing Jesus, and they got a, well, they, they were seeing those, the growth as, as it happened. So first there the little particles here and there, and they started to grow, and then they started to nucleate. So they, they were interested in the growth process, so they, they get to learn about that by, by doing Jesus at every step. Every step of the, of the growing process. Yes. Does that answer your question? Yeah, yes, okay. yeah, because maybe I would be interested to see the distribution of the nanoparticles in the soil. Yes, no, Jesus gives you distribution information. Yeah. Yes, because it's, it's statistical information what you're getting. Yes, yeah, I have a Jingle. Uh, I'm wondering about the thickness. Uh, if I want to uh, determine the thickness on the nanoparticles, so yeah. it can be true. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Can you tell us what the chance of accepting for both of, for example, the argument, the or? Chances of accepting proposals? Okay, so in Brockhaus in particular, uh, we have three beam lines. The low energy wiggler and the undulator beam line are, we still have time after we allocate all general user proposals. In the high energy wiggler, we have just the amount of proposals to fill the calendar with few gaps here and there. When there are more proposals than beam time, then you have to start rejecting some which is unfortunate. There's some beamlines at the CLS that are oversubscribed, so that's their case. We are a relatively new group, so we are building our user community, and it's a good time to step and there. But yes, anyone can send proposals, but it's a competitive review process. And if the, the, and we have in our website uh, a tab that uh, guides users through ha the whole process, and there's a video by Katrin Jansen uh, uh, showing how to write a proposal with like a good proposal. Yes. Uh, my question regarding the data processing: uh, when you grow a thin film, normally the, the film grows in a preferential mm -hmm. orientation. Yes. And when you make a grazing angle, uh, I was wondering. If you may, maybe can enhance um, the intensity of one of the, the direction, for example, if he grows in the one one one, so you use a grazing incidence, maybe you can enhance the intensity of the two zero zero. And when you determine the volume fraction of the mm -hmm. distribution of the the uh, directions, uh, maybe. Can be something wrong in that. We need to make a correction. Or is something that yes, the if you have texture and you you the the amount of the concentrations there. You mean several phases? Yeah, you're gonna be tricked by the texture about how much there is of. Well, let's say the the ratio between the intensities of the peaks won't be as in a Perfectly random powder. Is that what you're saying? Some some pigs might disappear completely. Mm -hmm. Am I right on that? <laughs> uh, he, he's asking about a film with a, a grown and this strong preferential orientation. 
And what would happen if I come with my fixed grazing angle? But I'm saying th there are going to be some peaks, uh, intensities won't be as in a perfectly random powder. Some peaks might not be there. Yes. It, it, it's, it's a texture sample, yeah. so... Because, it, it, for example, you have a thin film with two faces. Yes, two faces. And depending if you put the grazing angle in the orientation, uh -huh. it's not preparation for one of the faces. Yes. And you can have like a yes. different body. Yeah, you're not going to get the, the right answer there. You're going to have to. One thing you can try is the, the, the body, my micro body. Light is actually a table of white beam. So the white beam, you know, if the, the, the crystal is carved differently, the you know you will also see you know uh body pack the body pack is usually overlapping the same time. So you can separate them. Okay. So you could rotate your sample a little bit and try to find those that were left over. <laughs> About the, the calculate the, the, the right angle for the racing for the racing mm -hmm. scattering. So how deep goes the perpendicular sample? Well, how deep it goes, it will depend on the energy and the material. So so it's gonna be an attenuation length. So that's an attenuation length you wanna find in that website, for example. Uh, while well, you are preparing for the experiment. So you're going to know, okay, three microns, and my film is uh, half a micron. So I want to go this inclined, this grazing, if, so, to, so I have most of my beam attenuated in the film. Any more questions? Yeah, so, uh, <laughs> but, yeah, so if there's no more questions, uh, we break for now. We go for a lunch break and return at uh, one thirty. Yes, we return here. Yes, so, yes. At one thirty, we're gonna have Aaron the Ontovic with a small angular X-ray scattering talk. It's gonna be the last talk of the uh, school before we go to the computer room. Thank you.